Today, we are delighted to have a special guest speaker on our podcast, Dr. David Clark. If you haven't already heard of him, and you probably have, he's a Christian psychologist of over 35 years and has written the book, which we want to talk about, like, I'm, oh, Dr. Clark, you did it. Enough is Enough is the name of his book. And I am excited to discuss this book with you, Dr. Clark, and your work. So uh, a warm, warm welcome to the West Coast from an East Coast guy. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Well, my pleasure, Dr. Hawkins. I believe in you and what you're doing. Yeah. So you did it. Like I was thinking about this podcast, Dr. Clark, and you, you tackled the most difficult question, the most difficult. And that question, of course, to many listeners is, when is enough enough? And your book, Enough is Enough, and we will unpack that. And it's such a cool and important topic when you talk about narcissism and emotional abuse, which you and I are both passionate about. So give us an intro, Dr. Clark. Why did you write the book? Uh, Tell us a little bit about that. Well, number one, Dr. Hawkins, and you, you know this very well, the, the church is largely silent about the issue of abuse. We're seeing some change, uh, but frankly, not much. And when the church does handle abuse, they often mishandle it. We'll get more yeah. into that, I think, later in the podcast. So I thought, you know what, we, we need a solid, biblically-based book that would define abuse and then tell people exactly how God feels about abuse in a marriage or in an intimate relationship, and then... What most books don't do, here's exactly how to get out of that relationship. And so that's mm-hmm. why I wrote the book. I thought it was, I, I'm, a, I'm a clear person. I don't have any frills. It's just, here's what it is. It's very clear and direct and biblical. We're trying to help these ladies, frankly, escape. You, you got to know this. That, that is just such a, it's such an edgy topic. Like even you using the word escape. Uh, I mean, we, we will get into this. So I, I, I want to move into what exactly do you define as abuse? Because uh, that's that's confusing to a lot of people. A lot of folks, a lot of church folks would say, yeah, let's not use the A word. You know, that's almost like a four letter word. I think it's a five letter word, actually. But to many people, it's a four letter word. So you are bold enough to use that word. Tell us Tell us what abuse looks like. Well, you're right. The church especially, and many Christians are just terrified of using that word. They'll deny it, minimize it, justify it, but that's what it is. So my definition is pretty clear. It's a pattern. This isn't once in a while, he had a bad day, these things happen, normal marriage stuff. Oh, no. Even losing your temper here and there. No, no, it's a pattern. And a pattern that's never going to stop, a pattern of narcissistic, disrespectful and harmful behavior uh, exhibited by one person in an intimate relationship. Bottom line is it's one person slowly destroying another person. It is so important what you just said, Dr. Clark, that I want to just put a yellow highlighter over. It's a pattern. It's a chronic pattern. It's chronic and it's it's an in-depth pattern. I totally agree with you on that. It's not an episodic. It's not a, you know, a one-off where, ah, doggone it, you know, lost my temper. No, it's a pattern of overpowering. It's a pattern of of using anger to control. And so, uh, yeah, good. I, I completely agree. And, and so what happens then, Dr. Clark, when when a relationship is um, rife with this pattern. What, what can we, what, what happens to women largely? In a word, they're destroyed. I mean, you had the same experience, Dr. Hawkins. I I talked to ladies, it's been 10 years, it's been 15, 20, 30, 40 years, decades, years of this kind of abuse, and they are just broken down. Even a few years of this is very destructive. Uh, it's physically destructive, all mm. kinds of stress-related illnesses, autoimmune disorders, uh, yep. whatever you're weak in your body, it just attacks and destroys. I tell these ladies, I'm told when you leave this dirt ball, and he is a dirt ball because we've defined that, your health is going to improve like you wouldn't believe. 
you're going to feel better than you have for years. They're just so used to feeling sick and stressed. It's just, and of course, the, the narcissist is feeling healthy. He doesn't get it. I say, right. you're, he's going to outlive you if you don't get the heck out of there. So there's a physical impact. That's bad enough, but it's also emotional, depression, anxiety, addictions, uh, self-esteem shredded, identity gone. Who am I? What do I think? What does God have for me to do in this world? Nobody cares. The narcissist doesn't care. You're just like a zero. So emotionally, they're just a wreck. Codependency, of course, mm-hmm. often the case, and the church often yeah. promotes that. And then, of course, there's spiritual impact, which is, of course, very serious. Uh, relationship with God affected. It's frayed. Energy gone. And here's the bad news. And if I can't get I thought that was the bad stuff, news. I thought that was all bad news, <laughs> Dr. Clark. <laughs> all bad. Okay. You've got more the, bad news. The moms, okay. You're raising uh, some kids. Your little girls are going to date, be attracted to, and marry abusers. Because yeah. that's been the model. They hate yeah. to hear that, but it's true. And your little boys that you're raising, guess who they're going to be like? They're not going to be good guys. Very likely they're going to be abuse, abusers themselves. So it's important to leave as soon as you can. Once you know, and we define very carefully what we're dealing with. It's not a normal marriage situation at all. It's a, it's a monster who's destroying you and your kids. Let's, let's, we'll circle back to this generational and, and, you know, what happens generation upon generation upon generation. I, I want to comment on, and I want you to comment more on the, 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 the incredible stress this woman carries with her day after day, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. So, and tell me if your experience is like mine, Dr. Clark. What I have noticed when a woman finally leaves, and by the way, I, I, I share this story. I've seen this, I was going to say dozens, it's more than that, it's hundreds of times. When a woman finally gets away in any shape or form, there's one predominant emotion, and that is relief. Yes. Can you, right. oh, do you echo more. that? Oh, massive relief in capital letters. Oh, yeah. They, they realize, that's what you're getting at, Dr. Hawkins, they realize how bad it's been when they get out. And it's a whole new life. If you're sitting in an empty room staring at the wall, you're better off because you have peace. He's not coming home. You don't have to hear the garage door go up or his key in the lock, which sets your guts just churning. You, you're, you're free of that. He's still going to do his stuff after, after you're away from him. But you are now, you have distance, you're stronger, you're prepared. Life is so much better. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't know. This is such an important concept to communicate to, to women who are, in, in a sense, almost, um, I was going to use the word enslaved. I don't, that might be a little too strong, but they're, they're codependently attached. There's, there is some kind of attachment, but relief is what they experience. And they, but, but many of them haven't pulled apart enough to experience that kind of relief. So, you know, what you're sharing is kind of like, okay, you know, you tell me I will feel relief, but I, I don't. I, I, my guts do churn when I hear the key in the door, my, when I hear the car come in the driveway, when I, you know, this, the covert stuff, you know, he, and, and by the way, comment on this, Dr. Clark, the abuse may not happen. I mean, it may not be overt abuse, but it is occurring all the time. Can you speak to that? The pervasiveness of what we're talking about. Oh, yeah. And these guys are usually rock stars in the outside world. If uh, they die, if God happens to take them out and we're okay with that, there'll be a massive funeral because he's the greatest guy in the world. He's a deacon at church. He's, oh. He'll help all of his neighbors. He, he's just loved and adored. They don't live with him. Now, behind closed doors, different story. He may never raise a hand to you hmm. uh, in terms of physical abuse, but oh, yeah, the gaslighting, you know, the... The, the making you feel like you're crazy, the subtle criticisms that never end, you're never going to measure up. Mm. He, he treats you badly all day. And then, and then at, at night, you know, he, he'd like to make love to you and patting the pillow. He has no concept at all what you've been put through. 
So ladies that I talked to, I had one just uh, just uh, uh, yesterday who was were describing her husband, and she was shocked when I said, this is an emotional abuser, and this is a narcissist. Well, no, that, that simply can't be true. So they fight it. There's a lot of resistance to what we're saying. And I By have to her. convince them. I By know what her. I'm doing. By her, you're saying. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The codependent, the one who's the abuse. Oh, they fight what I'm saying tooth and nail. So, it's never, oh, well, thank you for sharing that. And I, I'm ready to get out. Let me follow the steps in your book. <laughs> no, they, that's part of course. That's part of leading is getting strong enough and preparing yourself and getting your kids ready to actually well, get away. And am, I, I, am I hearing you right here? Because this is an important thing to unpack. Are you saying to me, I mean, he doesn't want to use the A word. And are you also saying she doesn't want to use the A word either? He does not. Oh, no. Anything else. Well, he yeah. had a bad childhood or, or he, he stressed at work or he, his dad never taught him or I need to be a better wife. And I, my job is to be the hammer. I blow all those away. I don't care what his issues are and frankly, why he's like that. He can figure that out in his own therapy after you've left him if he wants to, which frankly, he's not going to do probably. I'm telling you, this is the impact on you. If somebody runs you over with their truck every single day, even if they don't mean to, what, what difference is that to you? You're being crushed. The lady thinks, if I can understand him, if I can figure out what he's like, then maybe I can adjust and, and help him. I say, no, that's, that's not your business, and that's not going to work. He doesn't care what you think. You could be absolutely accurate in a conversation with him about what he's like and what he has to do, like he cares. This person's not going to do anything different until he's ready to do it. Why do you think she is, by the way, my term for all of what you just said is called over-functioning. She's over-functioning, overdoing it, over-reading, over-watching the videos, over-thising, over-thatting, over-over-overing. And you used a phrase of, that's not your business, Step back. But why is she? What's all that about? Is it just trying to trying to figure it out? Is what, what do you understand about that, Doctor Clark? Why is she over functioning to such an extent? That's a good question. It, it, very often, it's, it comes from a number of sources. It's as I get her background. I do these phone sessions, and I, I find out how she was raised. Well, ninety percent of the time, if not higher, uh, her dad was an abuser and a narcissist, and her mom just put up with it. See, that's the model. She has been trained by her own family to be in this role. She goes mm. to a very conservative church, and they will tell her, no, sweetheart, you, your job is to submit. Your job is to be the best husband, the wife you can be, and you can actually change him. The burden in most churches is opposite of what Scripture says, which says <sighs> the husband has much more responsibility. And they'll, they'll turn to the wife, and suddenly it's up to her. There are no scriptures to support that, but it's the old boys club. And so you're going to have to do this. Mm. So she's the codependence is created, the overfunctioning by the church. Mm. Plus women are, women are nurturers. They're caring yeah, people. Yeah. They don't want a divorce for heaven's sake. I, I got my kids here. And so they're likely to stay when they should. So you, you've made the comment <clears throat> that, uh, is it, not all abusers are narcissists and not all narcissists are abusers or all are, are all narcissists abusive, but not all abusers are narcissists. Help us unpack that concept. You know, this is a tricky one. In my experience, I think you would, you would echo this, Dr. Hawkins. It's, it's, they're pretty much the same. Yeah. If you've got a narcissist, he's going to be abusive. He'd never admit that. Yeah, But the very nature of that incredibly selfish, even if it's to the degree of it's all about me and I never meet your needs for 25 years, okay, that's emotional abuse. Now, abusers come in different categories. They don't always have to be a narcissist, but it's very common. And our society is churning out narcissists at an alarming rate. Mm. I mean, they're everywhere. So I think what you're saying, just to help people unpack this, so if someone really is NPD-ish, narcissistic personality disorder-ish, somewhere on that spectrum, they're going to be abusive. Yeah. However, it could be that someone who is abusive, using power, uh, passive-aggressive, you know, these patterns of behavior, they really might not fit many of the criteria for NPD. Is that a fair statement? I think it is. And there's more hope for that person. Okay, I'm yes. a beast, but I'm not a narcissist. Okay, 
I, there's a lot of room to maneuver there. And so yes. that's the news. Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, Lundy Bancroft. By the way, you know Lundy Bancroft. He, he speaks. Yeah. yeah, he speaks to that topic. That I think he would say, uh, and and I don't. We don't need to parse this too much, but he would say, yeah, that not all abusers are narcissists, but all narcissists are abusive. Anyway, but a little bit of narcissism goes a long, long, long way. So whether somebody has all nine of the criteria for NPD, I I don't know that we need to parse that, but abuse is abuse is abuse. Do you, Dr. Clark, do you think it's a growing problem? You said that that we're we're churning, I forget what your words were, but we're we're churning out narcissists. I'd love to hear you speak to that. Oh, man. You'll like this, Dr. Hawkins. It's one of these things. I'll use no names, but a, a producer of a major national radio show. This was last month. Uh, w- was interacting, and and he he felt like uh, it, it was not. It was a kind of a small problem, and uh, and it really was kind of a small segment. And I, I said, "Are you kidding me?" Of course, I'm not very subtle. I try. I can't do it. <laughs> I said, "Are you living?" I love that you know, about you, by the way. Look around, for heaven's sake. Yeah, it is a serious problem. Now, this has been going on probably since the mid-60s, late 60s. Uh, breakdown of the family. Mm. If I'm in a home and mom and dad are falling apart and they're not meeting my needs, it becomes about me. i got to survive. i got to cope. That can breed narcissism. Mm. Plus, in this culture, we see uh, you know, parents spoiling their kids. This is a more and more of a problem. No discipline, mm. no boundaries, all the participation trophies in the world. <laughs> that's not real life. Johnny can never do wrong. I have some, our best friends are teachers, Bob and Pam Johns. And they, and they talk about how par- it's not the kids aren't the problem. It's the parents. Ah. The kid can do no wrong. And so the parents come in, the kids got an F they argue, Johnny acted out. That's the teacher's fault. So we have a whole generation now. And plus two generations teaching their kids. You're never wrong. And a society that's so litigious you can't have a car accident without suing somebody. You can't slip and fall in Walmart. It might have been your own dumb fault without suing. So it's just never my fault. And plus, the, our society, social media driven, everything's about me, what I think, what I feel, what I eat. If I have to see one more picture about somebody's lunch on Facebook, I'm going to scream. I don't care what your cheeseburger looks like. Get over it, right? Get over yeah. yourself. Come on. And of course, you know this, we as Christians, God's been taken out of everything. Yeah. God out of the government, God yeah. out of schools, yeah, yeah. God out of, uh, you know, out of society. You can't sing the national anthem. You can't, you know, you can't sing, uh, you can't pledge allegiance because God's name's in it. So we're taking God out. And this is what happens. Without God, it's about me. That's all I got. Me, myself, and I, the three of us are just uh, charging through the world, creating havoc. Yeah. yeah, we're fighting so, a wave of this. Yeah. So back to the topic of emotional abuse, Dr. Clark, it, um, I, I think you would agree that uh, much of what we're saying, these patterns, I want to keep using that word because I want people to be thinking these are patterns of behavior that happen again and again and again and again. And it's like, uh, boy, it's not even like water dripping on a rock because it's far worse than that. But Tell us what, how does emotional abuse show up? When you, like me, in our practices, we, we hear the stories again and again and again. What, what kinds of patterns do you see showing up that say, that raise it to the level of you saying, that's the A word, that is the, that's abuse. What, what are some patterns? What are some examples of emotional abuse that you, you hear again and again? Here's what it looks like. It is constant ongoing criticism, which really is in the form of verbal abuse, mm. can be subtle. Uh, but And there may be times when he won't do it, when he wants something from you, but it is, it is a, it's criticism of your appearance, of your weight, mm. of your energy level, of your mothering, of your friends, of your family. It just never, housekeeping, it never stops. You can't seem to quite do things right. That keeps you down and mm. him up. And in the area of communication, it, he, you're going to only talk about what he wants to talk about. If there's a difficult topic or some needs you've got, no, he's not. He'll see it as a personal attack. If you if you bring up something that might be sensitive, it might involve him doing, have done something that it would have hurt you. Oh, no, no, that's your fault. You'll be shouted down. You'll be talked over or he'll shut you down. Silent treatment. 
I know you've, you've heard this a million times, not talking, but the, you know, for a couple of hours to a couple of days to weeks on end, you will be punished if you ever bring up something he doesn't want to talk about or any perceived slight. See, normal people don't act that way. I want my wife saying now she's abrupt anyway and very blunt but and very clear, but I want to know if I've hurt her feelings and it will yeah. work it through. This guy yeah. will never do that. So these are hallmarks. Control is often a, a hallmark of the emotional uh, slash narcissist, emotional abuser, narcissist. He's in control of the finances. He's in control of your parenting. He's in control of, of, uh, of where you go to church and the friends you have and the clothes you wear. So it's a lot of control. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- those are, and of course, all, anger can be a problem. All, he may all, not the be, while, be all the while disavowing that he's controlling, right? He would say, it, no, exactly. no, no, me? What? Yeah. Me? Controlling? Never. How dare you? And they're so smooth and charming and articulate, they can just talk you out of it. Of course, everything is, what you just said reminds me, it's opposite world with these guys, as you know, our dog, and everything's turned back on you. I'm not abusive. You are. I'm not the oh. controller. You are. I don't criticize everything. You do. And they'll make you believe it because they believe their own lies. You start to wonder, man, am I losing it? So yeah, You might be, but because of him. I, I want to focus on what you just said, Dr. Clark. And I, I want to remind everybody what a healthy relationship looks like. So in a healthy relationship, Dr. Clark, you and I, we meet in Florida and we have coffee, but you upset me in some way. And I come to you and I say, hey, I, I want to bring to your attention something you just said that was hurtful to me. What do you do? You listen to me. You I'm- are approachable. You, you're inquisitive. I become real to you, and maybe in even a deeper, deeper way, like you learn about some of my preferences, and and you listen to me, you respond effectively to my concerns. Not so with the emotionally abusive, narcissistic man. So what happens, you just said something that I want you to unpack a little bit more. She approaches him, she I hear this so often. I just, I, I, I always hear it. Anyway, she, she musters up the courage to approach him. By the way, now notice those words. She musters up the courage to approach him. This is not an easy deal. She's thinking, OMG, OMG, OMG. This is likely to not go well, but I'm going to go ahead and bring something to his attention. And kaboom. Yeah. DARVO. Do you know the acronym DARVO, by the way? Um, no. Okay. DARVO stands for Defend, Attack, Reverse Victim, Offend. It, it was it was used. So you just you just described darvo I've been like darvo So she yeah. approaches him. She musters up the courage. She approaches him with, "Hey, can I talk to you about what happened today with the?" with our child, with the dog, with the car, boom, it comes winging back on her. She gets a left hook emotionally. Talk about that. Talk about he boomerangs it back. He doesn't receive it. He's not approachable. He certainly isn't inquisitive. He, she is invisible. Well, now she's kind of visible in the sense that she just got the emotional left hook. Talk about that. She screws up her courage to approach him, but boy, does she learn. Not sure I'm going to do that again. Exactly. And talk, pretty much about that. shut down. Now, you've described it very well, Dr. Hawkins. Exactly. There's an immediate, there's not even a break. There's an immediate, you won't get the words out of your mouth before he, he senses are you saying there's something wrong with me that I might have done something wrong? This is unacceptable because I'm pretty much perfect. So yeah, right away, it's you're talking to me. There'll be anger, defensiveness, or some of these guys aren't angry. And you'll see it in a counseling office. They're smooth. They're logical. And they will just turn the whole thing around on her. Well, honey, I did say that. And I did do that. But you want to know why I did? It's because you did this and you said that. Oh, it's masterful. If I had some Oscars in my office, I would hand them the statuette. Brilliantly done, Ed. You know what? You're a moron. You just you just told her she was a liar. Normal people say, I hurt you. 
I don't, I'm going to try to find out why, but what I'm saying is I acknowledge you have your feelings and you have your position and, and I'm, I'm sorry. And let's, let's find out and fix this. Yeah. These guys never, literally never do that. They just don't, they're not, they're incapable of expressing true apology and regret. You might get a lame apology just to kind of get it over with. They don't mean it. And there's going to be no discussion. So if you can imagine, I know you can 20 years, 10 years, even yep. five yep. years of all these unresolved, con- they're all built up. Nothing is ever resolved. The resolution is shut up. Don't bother me again. This is so critical, Dr. Clark, because the health blood of a relationship is receptivity, openness, transparency. I want to say those words again for everybody to think about. The, the health of a relationship is based upon openness, receptivity, approachability. I can come to you, Dr. Clark, and say, hey, look, I'm, I'm a little upset about something that happened. And you're going to go, tell me more. I want to learn about you. Uh, my goodness. And then if you indeed did something hurtful, you say, ah, oh, I did that. I was wrong. And magical words, I am sorry. And even more magical words, I will change. And even more magical words, I will make things right to restore our relationship because the harm that you did, Dr. Clark, or the harm I did with my wife, Christy, the harm that was done creates a brokenness. And if you don't fix that brokenness, then you've got break, 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 break. I'm making this all up, Dr. Clark, as I'm saying it, but that's what happened. So we, we've got this relationship strewn with broken connections. And worse than that, and I, I want to still camp on this notion, Worse than that, she's learned I can't, I, 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 must, I must become smaller here. I must. It's not, I, worth I, it. it's not worth the price. If I'm going to suffer and he'll make you suffer pretty soon, what's the point? And so you'll lose even more of your identity because you're not even talking about what's meaningful to you. So, I mean, let's just think about that for a moment. She becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Speak to that, Dr. Clark, that the the insidiousness of this because it's not it's not just one catastrophic break it is break 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 it's insidious and i'm presuming if your practice is anything like mine the women are coming to you after 5 10 15 20 25 years of break 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 is that are you seeing is that what you're seeing too Oh, yeah. Death by a thousand cuts, Death by a thousand death. blows. You absorb it, and there's no resolution, and he doesn't care, and he's going to do it again tomorrow and tomorrow. Now, he'll still harm you, but now you're not even able to voice that. Part of healing is expressing it and being understood, as you're describing, Dr. Hawkins, and, and fixing it. Nothing's ever fixed. And it's your dumb fault in the first place. He'll convince you it's your fault. You might go to the pastor, who will also say, well, that's your fault. If he hadn't done this or done that, and so the beat just goes on. So identity is just stripped away. And the insidious thing is your own children. He'll turn your own children against you. Now, he'll Mm. often do that in many ways behind the scenes. But if these things are happening in front of the kids and you're being disrespected and shut down, they'll do the same thing to you as they get into their teen years. One of the saddest things I ever see is a lady who's got grown adult children who have cut her off. She stayed with the dirt ball, and now she's lost her kids. They'll, they'll interact with her, but they pity her at best. Won't talk with her, don't respect her. That is awful. But that's what happens yeah. when you stay too long. Dr. Clark, I want to put a huge, gigantic pin in what you just said. And I want us to come I want I want to talk about some other things. But what you just said, I am seeing an epidemic of. I'm seeing an epidemic, and I I wonder how many listeners right now can identify this. I'm seeing an epidemic of, I'm going to use a number, a 50-year-old woman who's got three adult children, ages 22, 24, and 28. She's been married for 35 years, and her kids have been turned against her by this emotionally abusive man who is slick 
and charming and crafty and anyway put a pin make yourself a note okay we'll come back and i'm going to i'm giving a message to my our producer here Katie Katie the topic of scapegoating and turning adult children against it it's okay anyway it's an epidemic it is it's it's evil i'll tell you like, that is evil he is he is he will spend years getting them on his side and turning them against you. What kind of a person would do that to his wonderful wife on yeah. dirt ball and emotional abuse? Oh my goodness. Ah, these topics get me going, you know, Dr. They just do. Okay. Let's talk about what are the most common. Let's think about the church now back to the church. What are the most common non because, because these women, they're largely, many of the women that come to us are largely involved in the church. And I, I don't want to rail on the church, but there's a lot of uh, damaging approaches to abuse. If they even use the word, if pastors even use that word, used by pastors and church leaders. Talk to us about what you see. By the way, you're, you're, I, I'm pretty bold. I think you, you got me. You're a little bolder than I am. So I'm going to kind of, I'm, I'm going to duck behind you a little bit. I'm, I'm with you, but I'm going <laughs> to. You don't mind if I kind of hide in your shadows a little bit on this topic. I want to. I don't like, blame you. Uh, uh, you should see the emails I get and the texts from pastors. Oh my! I don't reply because they're really venomous and they think I'm wrong. I can support what I say by scripture, which is very important to me. I wouldn't recommend it otherwise. They're the ones in the wrong, but they don't get it. Okay, here's what they say. And I've heard these stories, as you have, Dr. Hawkins, from a million ladies. Went to see my pastor, and I was told, first of all, it's not abuse. What you're describing here is normal. It's not abusive. They minimize it. They they deny it. They justify it. He's he's a good guy. He's he's on the uh, on the on the he's on the church. He's he's on the leadership team. He's on the. He's exactly. singing in the choir. He's simply can't be true of him. Well, you want to say, think about this. You're not living with him, but the pastor doesn't go there. He goes by his experience with the guy. The guy is schmoozing you. <laughs> anyway, so it's not abuse. Then, of course, they'll be told to submit. Well, you're, you know, and they'll get the Bible out and Ephesians and all that and First Peter. You know what? That doesn't apply when you're dealing with a serious sinner who's destroying you. You get away from that person biblically, but you'll be told you have to submit. Hold hold it. Camp camp on the, I want to unpack a couple of these points. So you just referenced 1 Peter, I think it's 1 Peter 3, by a word, you will win them to the Lord. Is that not an accurate, I'm I'm, I'm playing, I I shouldn't say devil's advocate. That's not, I don't want to use that phrase. Is that, she's she's memorized that scripture. She's been told that. God. By a word, by a word, you can turn this whole thing around. By a what is it? By a soft and gentle approach, or whatever. What, Turns away saying, wrath. Yeah, those are the verses. And my response is very simple. Yeah, that's true for a normal, decent man. Uh, oh, that will work every time. Uh, it will not work with this special category of emotional abuser and narcissist. We call that enabling, which Scripture talks against. So they're uh, missing the picture. They don't believe he's that bad. And if uh, they do believe he's that bad, well, then if you submit. And, and, and along with that comes, if you just love him enough and you kill yourself and you meet all of his needs. Love him and I, more. Mm. Exactly. In time, this is this is still the most favorite approach of pastors and, and Christian leaders and, and church counselors. He will eventually change. My response is, no, he won't. That's enabling. This is a different kind of a creature we have on our hands here. Yeah. And, you, you know, that, and the burden is not on you to change him anyway. Where are you finding that in Scripture? It's his responsibility to love you as Christ loved the church. That, that's the highest possible so thing. Are, are, you are saying, and I agree completely, by the way, I was going to hide behind your coattails, but I'll, I'll join you here. I'll lock arms <laughs> with you. So you are saying when, when pastoral leadership, when any kind of leadership says, you know, just submit. Love him more. First Peter three, by a word you will win them to the Lord. Just be patient, patient, patient. You are saying totally wrong. Totally. That it's Absolutely. that's enabling. And by the way, I, I speak long and hard about this. So enabling is at the opposite end of the continuum from intervention. And intervention is what brings about change. Intervention and accountability. So you're saying to me. 
I'm, I'm thrusting you out there into the front of the limelight here, Dr. Clark. That's totally wrong. It's the exact opposite thing that needs to happen. Are you? Is that what you're stepping out and saying? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It has never worked in the history of mankind, and yet it's, it is the it is looked to, and they'll, they'll find scriptures to cobble together that are out of context in order to make you do that. It's not going to work. And in fact, the narcissist, the emotional user, loves the fact that you're trying and killing yourself and, and, and every day hoping for something different. He knows she's got you. She's, yeah, she's pretzeling herself. And she and, and by the way, you, you see this. She has really tried these these um, these avenues. She's tried to submit. Everything. She's tried to love right. him more. She <laughs> I'm going to tell you a really quick kind of funny story, Dr. Clark. I, uh, I approached an editorial board a number of years ago, and I said to them, I, w- I want to write a book for men to help men to really grow up. I, th- I think it's just really needed. And they looked at me like I had six eyes. <laughs> what, 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 do you, what do you mean you're going to write a book for men? Well, I want to write a book for men to help them grow and change and become the men that God wants them to be. And they said, David, 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 <laughs> David, David, David. Women are the ones that buy the books. Women are the ones that read the books. Women are the ones that do handstands, that watch all your videos. It's women. I mean, unfortunately, I know, I, I, I hear your heart, David. You, you want to reach men, but no, it's the women. My point really was not feel sorry for me, but just women are, they're doing handstands. They, they are pretzeling themselves doing they're reading these scriptures. Anyway, back to the point. They're do, it's wrong, right? It will, you're saying some hard things. That will never work, correct? And never, never is a, is a tough word, but it's true. Never going to work. In fact, the narcissist, the emotional abuser, is entertained by, by your pretzeling. And all the things that you do, because he expects you, this actually feeds the narcissism. It's all about me. You're killing mm, yourself to mm. meet my needs and change me. Mm. I don't, they don't think they have to change. So you're literally wasting your time and hurting yourself in the process. And you're also violating scripture because that's not what the Bible says. That, that, that Ephesians 5.25, in my opinion, says pretty much it all. Loving your wife as Christ loved the church. Highest possible standard. Plus, you're the leader. Ephesians mm. 5, 22 through 24. You put those together, guess who has the burden? Never the woman. She wow. has her responsibilities, yes. But he has the great burden. And the church overlooks that most of the time. Do you confront her then? Do you say to her in a compassionate way, look, it, it, <laughs> You're you're going down a path that won't work, and you've got to you've got to do something that is so difficult. It's called boundaries. It's called intervention. It's called confrontation. So, so I was just speaking at the um, uh, American Association of Christian Counselors, and when I said what I just said, when I said, "Yeah, boy." She is going to have to learn about boundaries. She's going to have to learn about intervention. She's going to have to learn about uh, confrontation. There were some r- rustlings of, of some chairs and some like, really, you're going to ask her now to do more? Speak to that. Is that a fair thing for us Caucasian males to say to her, yeah, we really are asking you in a way to do less in another way to do more, less of First Peter 3, less of submission, less of all of that stuff, and more of drawing lines in the sand. Is that what you're really saying here? Because it's we're stepping yeah. on some we're stepping on some toes. Oh, we are. This is a, this is a totally different track from what they've been taught and how they've been raised and what their pastor might say. However, like Dr. Phil, how is that going for you? It's been 20 years. It's been 30 mm. years. It's been 15 mm. years. How That's not working. Why would more of that work? Now we're going to go to the tough love. And I'll say, look, this is going to take time. This isn't overnight. You're not leaving him tomorrow. You're not strong enough. Your kids aren't ready. you got to get the oh, finances straight. Oh, perfect point. Love it, love it, love it. Keep going. You, got, you have to. It might take you five, six months as much as a year or more to get strong enough. Because once you leave this dirt ball, 
Oh, the reaction is going to be very intense and you got to be ready for that and you got to build your new life. You got to get through the divorce process very likely if it goes that way, if God releases you. So yeah, we're, we're going to get you strong so we can apply Matthew 18 and Romans 16 and 1 Corinthians 5, mm. which says when you have a serious sinner, you confront that person. Now in this, in this scenario, my, my approach is you're going to leave him first and from a safe distance and you're strong and, and you're not codependent and you've healed and your kids are with you and they're ready. Then you give him a chance to make the changes. He either does or he doesn't. Most won't. So we're going to get to that. But a, 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 a qu- another quick uh, anecdote. In my groups, I've got some groups of men. And I, I do have some men who are really making some changes. I asked recently, I asked a group of seven men in, the, in my advanced core group. I said, I said to them, Guys, what did it take to to hit the bottom? Universally, they said separation. That's another yeah. podcast for us, Dr. Clark. Well, it is, and I couldn't but, agree more. These guys don't change until you leave him, until you say, I'm done, I'm gone. If you want me back, knock yourself out. And some will, and I've seen it too, but it never happens when you're with him. Never seen it, 35 years, say, ever. oh. Oh, this is such hard truth, Dr. Clark. Say yeah. it again. It never happens when you stay co, uh, co-entangled, co-dependent, co-operating, co-co-coing. You're saying, no, no there's got to be some kind of break. There's got to be a breakdown that leads to the breakthrough. Right. You've got to create a crisis in his life. I've, I'll tell ladies all day long in these phone advice sessions I do now that when you leave a man, and you're done, and you tell him, last man on earth, I don't care what you do, I'm through with you. His reaction to that will tell you all you need to know. The right man will yeah, call yeah. the Marriage Recovery Center. He will get into a group. He'll find a therapist. He'll heal. He'll win you back. He doesn't care how long it takes, and it will be consistent. The wrong man will go the other way. Blame you, character assassination. Go to the accounts and drain all the money. Hire a sleazeball attorney. Blame you. Okay, I say that's your answer. It's going to go one of two ways. The intervention. My goodness, we, <laughs> this is really kind of eerie, Dr. Clark. You, we've been reading the same stuff. We've been seeing the same people. We've been doing the same work because that's exactly what I say. The intervention will tell you everything you need to know. When, you done, when you've done the intervention, when there's a breakdown that could lead to the breakthrough, won't always, but the break when there's a breakdown Whew. All right, let's get let's get back to God. What's God got to do with it? Got to do with it? Got no, oh, and I shouldn't have done that. That was we'll, we'll edit that out, right, Katie? Thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> what, 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 how does? Oh my word! How does God? How does God feel about abuse, Doctor Clark? What? What? Because that's what we're going to go back to, right? We're going to go back. We're going to talk to her about. Look, let's. Uh, Look, let's talk about what what does scripture really say? What is how does God feel about I mean, there's a scripture that says God hates divorce, comma, and the man who covers his home in violence. We don't right. ever hear the second part. You always hear the first part, right. God hates divorce. But right. I think you're about to tell us that God hates everything that leads up to the threat of divorce. But tell us about oh, yeah. God. And God's heart in this matter. Oh, he, God is furious with, mm. with a godly rage at men who abuse their wives. We see it in Old Testament and we see it, we see it in New. Mm. In that Malachi 2 uh, chapter, and that passage, as you just referenced, Dr. Hawkins, that's some of the strongest words from God himself to these men mm. that are abusing their wives, wanting to get rid of them for no good biblical reason. And in that day, if you were shunted aside, you'd starve to death in the desert. So he was not going to allow that, and that's why he allowed divorce in those cases. And these men were cut off from him. Mm. So he, yeah, he's. People often say, "Well, yeah, God hates the sin, not the sinner." No, no, he hates the sinner. When you're in serious sin and you're Mm. damaging your wife, no, he hates you. And if you want to get back with God, you better break and repent. He'll accept that. Oh, it's very, very clear language. God, God has no problem saying you're wrong, and, and you're going to pay for this. And this is not acceptable. And I'm going to protect your wife. So, oh yeah, he's you, mad. And this you know is not mad at you. These it, emotional abusers are clueless. They don't get it and, until they, if they're if they're abusers and they can change, they'll get it and they'll be ashamed of themselves. 
Dr. Clark, this is so compelling. You're, you're, you are so compelling. Why, why, I'm, I'm puzzled here. Why would, wouldn't a pastor, why wouldn't they want to have this conversation with you? What's, I, and that's off on a tangent a bit here, but I mean, you just, you just exegeted, if I'm using the word right, Old Testament scripture. It, it is what God has, I, I completely, why wouldn't a, a pastor say, oh my goodness, yeah, we are, we're barking up the wrong tree here. We need to come alongside these women. We need to speak out against abuse. What, what, what are they protecting? What, what's the, what's the deal? Well, I think the ones that I have dealt with, and I don't bother really anymore because I don't like to waste my time because you really can't convince them. I'll say, read my book and get back to me, which they probably never will, because I can support it. My dad sent me and paid for two seminaries that I went to and graduated from. So the Bible is preeminent. But these pastors, very often, and this is this is a little secret that people don't want to hear, they grew up in abusive homes. Their dad, authoritarian, maybe a, maybe a pastor himself or whatever he did, he was authoritarian and abused mom. Mom took it. And so that's what he's used to. Nobody mm. ever asked the pastor, what about your background? Well, I ask those questions. Usually it doesn't go too well. Okay, so they've learned it that way. They have been taught in seminary. Either they were taught virtually nothing about this whole scenario of abuse, mm -hmm. and they just have the submission passages. So they're going by the letter of the law, and they're not taught the whole scope of Scripture. And frankly, I hate to say this, but many pastors are passive and uh, you know, just gut like I hate to say it, gutless wonders when it comes to helping a woman who's abused. It's easier to side with the guy. It's like the old boys club. Yeah. I talked to a lady just this morning on the phone. Yep. She went to see her pastor. The pastor knew her. she'd served in a church for 30 years. He knew her. She finally had the guts to go to him and lay it out. And he blamed her and he sided with her husband. Oh, I said, I've heard that story a million times. When you're ready to leave your husband, you're going to leave that church too and find one where the guy gets it. And some pastors are doing their wives. But even the pastor's wives, they'll often side with the husband. And, and the wife is the problem. Or the yeah, great... Or speak to this, or they're going to take an approach of, you've heard this quote a million times, it takes two to tango. It's a two-way street. Right. It's a, the, 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 these problems are co they're, you know, it, 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 come on, two people, two people have created this mess, and two people have to get out of this mess. And so, you know, I, as Pastor Schmo, I'm not going to side with one or the, or the other. And speak to that. Ooh, gutlessness. I, oh, it is. Do, do you think in when we're talking about emotional abuse and narcissism, I, I don't believe it takes two to tango. Does she have I some agree. things to work on? To be sure. But this, this problem, this problem that we're talking about right here, emotional abuse, no, she does not have a pervasive, persistent pattern of abuse. She does not. Can she react at times? Certainly, like a can of Coca-Cola. But speak to that. Speak to, you know, that, that that it takes two to tango. And that's what Pastor Schmo is saying. What do oh, you yeah. think? They're, they're, literally, I went to seminaries. So they, they're taught this in seminary. This is the party line. Always takes two. Now, in a normal marriage, I did normal marriage counseling for 35 years. I don't do it anymore because it just drives me crazy. But uh, when I was doing it, if it was a normal situation without abuse, without narcissism, yeah, it's a balanced mm -hmm. approach. I wrote a book. I don't want a divorce. Very balanced approach. This mm -hmm. is not the case with the emotional abuser or the narcissist. It's one person. I say this is very unbalanced. You're at fault. You're damaging your wife and your kids. You're going to get help. Now, I think to the to degree, mm -hmm. your wife, I'll tell the lady, you, yeah, your, your role has you taken it too long. You have tolerated too much. You're a codependent and you're an enabler. Yeah. I say, I'm going to get you a t-shirt on the front. It says, I'm a codependent on the back. Help me just for a little humor, but yeah, let's get you out of this. Right. You're going to get strong. I'll say, look, you go to therapy tell the guy I need to get therapy. You're a narcissist on the QT. I, cause I messed up and I'm the problem. He believes that anyway, the truth is you're getting therapy to get strong enough to leave him and live a different life. So it's not balanced. I'll say, look, if the guy changes, and I know this is what you do, Dr. Hawkins, if we have a guy that's changing and repentant and his wife's getting stronger and she's on a codependent, to, at the right time, now when we do couple therapy, yes, it yes, works. Yes. Hey, now we got something going. I say, that's way down the line. Let's make sure he's got it and he's past the point of no return and he's changed. 
Yeah, because I, I see and I've said in other other podcasts to start out in couples counseling when he is manipulative, passive aggressive, abusive, retaliatory, all of these incredibly negative traits that do not coexist with what we call couples counseling, which is mutually agreed upon, mutually benefit mutuality. It ain't mutual with with him. So he doesn't care. It, 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 that's why marriage counseling is a waste of time until he's ready. He might play the game in the session. Mm-hmm. He might try to take over the session too. But if he, if he even plays the game and says, yeah, I'll try that. When they get to the car, he takes her head off. And, and I can't believe, and I'm not going back. And I, it's all your fault. Or he has a way of co-opting the counselor because they're very persuasive and turning it. So the woman, once again, is the one that has to make all the changes. Mm-hmm. They come. I used to see couples like this very briefly because I thought this guy's not changing. I was very homework oriented. And they'd come in the next session. He hadn't done his homework. She had. Classic. My response was, I'm not seeing you today, and you're going to pay me because you have not done your homework. Mm. He wanted her to do her homework, so it would be about her. Well, I'm not an idiot. We're not having the session, and you're going to pay me. I would never see them again. Whatever. I'd start seeing the wife like I do now and getting her strong enough to get away from it. Dr. Clark, sadly, we are approaching our uh, end point here. And... There is so much more to say. Uh, we've got to have you back, sir. I'd love to. Uh, I, 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 what I want to do, I, I want to have you back on. I want to give a kind of a teaser to, to folks. I can imagine you and I talking about the lies she believes. Uh-huh. That seems like just such an important thing for us to unpack. I want to unpack the topic of when and how does she do a separation and get this breather so she can have some relief and start making better, healthier choices for herself. And then I also want to talk about this scapegoating issue. So I don't know. I'm not sure. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out what, but let, let's, how about this for a caption, the lies she believes and then, and we'll, we'll, we'll weave in scapegoating. Okay. And we'll weave in some of these other topics. All right. My goodness, uh, if you've appreciated this podcast as much as I have, I, holy cow, Dr. Clark, you, you have a ring of truth, you have a ring of authority, you have a ring of experience, and in, in, this, in this topic, with these topics that are so fraught with confusion, you offer clarity to folks, and I, my goodness, don't stop speaking, don't stop writing, and We'll have you back. So, all right. Thank you so much for being here. Listeners, as always, if any of this resonates, and of course, it all resonates because it sure resonates with me. It's my experience. Please know we are available to help. You can reach out to us by visiting our website, www.marriagerecoverycenter.com to learn more about what we do. And you can find information uh, in our show description. If you've enjoyed today's show, give it that five-star rating, and be sure to subscribe to our channel to be notified of new episodes. And with Dr. Clark, holy cow, I want you to encourage you to pick up his book, books, but one book that we referenced today, Enough is Enough, which you can find on Amazon or visiting his website, www.davideclarkphd.com. One more time, David E. Clark, that's with an E, C L A R K E PhD dot com to learn more about his work. We'll we'll have we'll have that information for you too. Thanks for tuning in, and we will talk to you all again very soon. God bless. Thanks again, Dr. Clark. Well, thank you.